it's time for us to hear from people who really know something. Okay? Uh, so we had this little warm up. Now you get real knowledge. And we're going to hear first from somebody who I consider a friend and somebody who, if he's not willing to consider me a friend, I hope that he will at least acknowledge that he is my teacher. He is my teacher. This guy has more students than you do. He has more students than all of us combined do. Rob Schmitz is heard on NPR, which, depending on which program he's heard on, has an enormous audience in the millions. And so he has taught more people about what's going on in China, how China's changing, how that affects ordinary people than really almost anyone, okay? Uh, in terms of readership and things like that, the New York Times doesn't come close. No one else comes close. So Rob Schmitz is a master teacher. Now, what do I want to say about him? He set out from the time that he was a small child, he said, I want to work on the radio, and I want to do it in China, and I want to explain that. <laughs> there wasn't a single word of that statement that was true. <laughs> None of it was true. None of it was true. He grew up in the upper, mid, uh, upper Midwest. He went to college, studied Spanish. He is a credentialed Spanish teacher. He wanted to work in Latin America, applied to the Peace Corps, they sent him to China. <laughs> and I tell this story partly because Rob's story is like many of ours. It's full of happenstance, serendipity. Things happen. He later decides, yeah, journalism's a good thing. I like doing it. I should learn a little bit more about it. He goes to Columbia School of Journalism and meets the love of his life who stood at this microphone a year ago. And her book is one of the five that you could choose. At the risk of a, sowing a divide in the family, I'm going to tell you not to choose that one. Yeah, she's little soldiers. And the reason I'm going to say don't choose that one is because I want you to wait for the new paperback edition to come out. <laughs> and I want you to buy multiple copies and give them to your colleagues as well. What I'm going to advise you to do right now is to choose, you, have, you need to choose one of these five, and not all of you have done so, is to choose Rob's book, uh, the one that's fourth from the left, okay? The Street of Internal Happiness. He's going to be talking a little bit, he'll share some stories from that book, uh, but this is a treasure. It is one of the books, actually I should confess that I'm also assigning uh, Lenora Chu's book uh, to uh, the teacher. For the very first time, I'm teaching an online class this fall on contemporary China. And as it happens, uh, four of the books up there are on the reading list. Okay? But in any event, I want to encourage you to choose Rob's book. It is a true treasure because he takes you into the lives of these people and he takes us backward in time and we learn about war with Japan, we learn about experiences that people had, brings us through the history of the People's Republic, but it always is focused on where are these people today? And he tells other serendipitous stories about chance meetings, chance opportunities. A guy that wants to, wants to have a little sandwich salon, but winds up making money in the accordion business. Did you know there was an accordion business? This is just one of the many things that you will learn from my teacher, Rob Schmitz. Won't you welcome him? Go for it. Uh, I, don't, I don't really know what to say after that. That was kind of, that was kind of crazy. Um, I'm not really a teacher. You guys are the teachers. I'm honored to be here. Uh, thanks, Clay. Uh, thanks to the 1990 Institute, and, and, and thanks to all of you. I'm really honored to be te uh, to be speaking to teachers. Uh, my mother is a retired elementary school teacher, so I grew up surrounded by teachers. Um, as Clay mentioned, I'm a credentialed teacher, but I spent about six months doing that, and I was not strong enough for that job. <laughs> I won't go into the details. Um, 
I also was just told today that, uh, so my, my wife was here last year, Lenora was here last year, and she apparently did a bang up job here, uh, which, you know, there was like no pressure on me. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, al I was also told that her book, uh, it was here, but somebody stole it. And then I was also told that nobody stole my book. <clears throat> so You have a higher caliber of reader. Clay, you said that there were four books on that list. Uh, there was one that was not on the list. I, I assume that's mine. No. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I'm not even going to go into it. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Clay. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about... Where's the... Oh, there's the pointer. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit today about my book. Um, so I... Uh, where are we here? Okay. Here we go. That is the cover of my book. Um, so in 2010, uh, I, I came back to China. I originally lived in China in the 1990s uh, as a Peace Corps volunteer. Clay mentioned that, that I was trying to go to South America, and they sent me to China, uh, a, a country uh, that I hadn't given one thought about uh, prior to being told that I was going to live there for the next two years. Uh, it was 1996, and I was a teacher for two years at a teacher's college. So I was training uh, future teachers uh, in English. You know, I was teaching them uh, about literature, about history. I was given really interesting textbooks by the state, by, by, by the government of China to teach from. And they said all sorts of funny things about American history. That, that in every, every sentence ended with, and that is why the capitalist system will never live. Or, you know, it, it, just, it, was, it was full of like, amazing propaganda and incredible, uh, you know, incredible sentences of like, grand proportions. And, um, and so I, I, was, I was actually asked to teach from that book. And, and I still have that book today. And I still will uh, bring it out to, to visitors to my house and just you know, show them some of this stuff because it's, it's just great. Um, but um, so I taught for two years there. I was in... Uh, in the city of Zugong in Sichuan province uh, in southwest China. And it was the, in, for Zugong, it was the first time that that city, which is a smaller city, but a city of around you know, f half a million people or so, uh, it was the first time that they had, had foreigners that lived in the city. In fact, before I lived there, it was a closed off city. Uh, back then in China, there were closed off counties and closed off areas that foreigners were not allowed to go to, uh, primarily because they were really poor. And uh, Zigong was one of them, and it had just opened up, and so I was the first foreign uh, person to live there, actually you know, have residence there. Uh, so I had a really amazing experience for those two years, and I think in many ways it formed, um, it, it, it brought me away from teaching and towards writing and towards journalism, because uh, in many ways what I saw and the people that I met every day uh, inspired me to want to write about China because I thought it was just the most amazing country. The people that I met um, were, were incredible, um, and I formed a lot of really personal connections with people on the ground in Zigong, with my students, with other teachers um, that, that uh, I'll always cherish, and I'm, I'm, I'm really good friends with a lot of people still in Zigong, so I still go back. Many of my students and other teachers have moved on to different places in China, but I've tried to keep in touch with many of them. So this, this um, what I'm going to talk about today is the book that I wrote, which stems from a series of, of radio stories that I reported uh, back when I first came to, uh, when I first returned to China in 2010. In 2010, I was uh, hired as the China correspondent for Marketplace. Uh, if you listen to public radio, you probably know, you probably listen to Marketplace. It's, a, it's an economics or a business program. And I had to cover... Uh, an economy, uh, the second largest economy in the world, uh, 1.3 billion people, just me, <laughs> um, which is which <laughs> a little challenging. Um, and I think, you know, the, the one lesson that I learned right away um, was that I was, my first year or two, I was sort of floundering, wondering, you know, how do I cover this country? How do I, I, I translate this country to my listeners uh, here in the United States in a way that they can relate to the people of this country. Um, because I was looking around me and, you know, I think a lot of media, and I think this is a lesson for all of us, and especially if you're teaching about China in the classroom, a lot of the information that we get from China comes from the media, right? A lot of the media about China is devoted to the Communist Party of China. So the, the, when you look at most headlines, 
It's about the government. Okay, most of the stories about China in today's media landscape is about the government of China. Uh, because I had lived in China before and I had been in the Peace Corps and I, you know, kept coming back after the Peace Corps, I had a different view of China. And my view of China was that the party itself is not a very good representation of the people of China. And it's, it's very difficult to represent 1.3, 1.4 billion people. It's a very diverse country. With, with it, it's an enormous country. There are, no matter what the Chinese government, the message that they try to sh kind of sell of this like, homogenous country, it is very diverse. And wherever you go in China, you, you know, there's different dialects that are almost sound like different languages. Uh, when I lived in Sichuan, I had to learn the Sichuanese dialect, which is, you know, if you listen to that dialect and if you're from Beijing, you kind of have to strain to kind of understand it. It's a, it's a, very, it's a very strange dialect to listen to if, if you're not familiar with it. But, you know, I, I learned a lot about the diversity of China. So what I wanted to do as a journalist was to tell the story of China not through the government, not through the party, but through individual Chinese people. And so I started to embark on this uh, series that I worked on called Street of Eternal Happiness, where I realized that what I wanted to do was to, for a year, every month for a year, I was going to tell the story of the street that I lived on. Uh, the street I live on in Shanghai is called Changlelu. Uh, it literally means Long Happiness Road. Um, I, I changed it a little because Long Happiness Road sounds a little weird in English. So I, I, I said Street of Eternal Happiness, which is close enough in Chinese. We say Chabodo. And uh, so I started to focus on this very small street that's around, uh, it's about a couple miles long. And I wanted to, for the next year, tell the story of individuals who live or work on this one street. So for every month of a year, I would focus on one individual. And my, thank God my executive editor at Marketplace thought it was a great idea. And she told me to go forward. And so I did that. And um, the series did really well. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the series as well as the, the book. Because the, the series later on, I, I was approached by publishers and saying, you know, you should write a book about this. And so I started to focus. When I wrote the book, I focused on certain characters that were in the series and kind of did a deep dive into their lives and spent the next three years, uh, every chance I could get, hanging out with uh, these five characters. I picked five characters to focus on. And I'm going to talk a little bit about these characters. But the, the theme of this book and the theme of the series were, was what are people dreaming about? What, what are individuals in China dreaming about? What are their hopes? What are their aspirations? Where do they see themselves in this world? What do they see for themselves and their families five, ten years later? Because I felt like the time that I was in Sh Shanghai in 2010, the you know, GDP was growing at around 10% a year. You know, no other civilization on this planet had ever grown this fast. And I felt like it would be interesting, and I'd, I'd never really read a book about modern China, w which really focused on people in one in, in the most in the wealthiest and fastest growing city in the in the country most most uh, books about shanghai are about like the roaring 20s and the 30s when the foreigners were living in shanghai and they're all about these decadent foreigners who you know in all the movies about shanghai too really focus on this too this period of time when you know they had the foreign concessions and, and everything, and it's all about drugs and sex and violence and things like that. You know, you often forget by watching these movies that Shanghai is a Chinese city that is very, very Chinese. And so I wanted to focus on Chinese people who live in this city. Um, so that's what I did. Uh, so this is this is the street that I live on. Um, it it is in the former French concession, which when when, when Shanghai was divvied up between the, the foreign powers after the Opium Wars, uh, the, the French had one part of the, the city and they made it look very French. They, they, you know, these are really kind of winding, narrow kind of streets. If you've been to Shanghai, you've been to this area, you know, you know the, the, the trees are the sort of the definitive thing in, in, this, in, this, um, in this neighborhood. The, the French planted this one type of tree called the London plane tree every about 15 feet or so. 
and it builds this canopy over the street so that in the summer, uh, in really hot days like right now, I just left two days ago. Uh, by the way, it's midnight in Shanghai right now, so forgive me. I'm, I'm trying to, I had like three or four cups of coffee, so I'm trying to stay awake here. But uh, it, it, it offers a lot of shade, uh, and, and, and they're really beautiful. Um, so, uh, and then, of course, in, in the French concession, there are uh, hundreds of these sort of alleyway neighborhoods where people live uh, and, you know, of course, put out their laundry. That's kind of the definitive kind of picture of Shanghai right there. Uh, but I'm going to tell you a story about uh, some of the characters that I focused on and some of the dreams uh, that they have for their lives. Um, so the, the first character in my book, uh, his name is Chen Kai, and uh, CK, and he's a, a young man. He's the youngest person in my book. He was born in the 1980s, and I think that Clay talked a little bit about him. He owns a sandwich shop, and his dream at first, uh, when I first met him, was for this sandwich shop to flourish. And, um, it, but but it, it didn't flourish because he decided to put the sandwich shop on a second floor in, of, of a building and it was obscured by these London plane trees that are all over the place. You couldn't see it. And he wasn't very good at advertising it. And, uh, but that's, that's okay because on the side he was selling accordions. And you know, it, was, it, was just, it was kind of interesting because like, only in today's Shanghai can you sell sandwiches and accordions at the same time and actually make a heck of a lot of money. So CK, of, of all my characters, makes the most money by far. He's, he's, he's quite comfortable. Uh, and he's very good at selling accordions. Uh, he sells accordions because he himself is an accordion player. He worked at a state-run accordion factory after he graduated from college in Guangdong province. He's from the province of Hunan. And uh, he, uh, very, very much against his parents' wishes, quit his state-owned job, which in China, if you have a state-owned job, if you work for a state-owned factory, that is a great job. You're gonna have a great pension, you're gonna, everything's gonna be taken care of you, for you. Uh, but he decided that after two years, that what he was seeing around him is that he, no one was really working that hard. And they would come to work, they'd read the newspapers or something, and, and, and he was supposed to be managing uh, folks, and he just realized that he wasn't learning anything. And so he quit and he joined an Italian accordion maker who was setting up shop in Shanghai. And this Italian engineer had come from Italy to, to start an assembly line. And so he taught CK uh, how to teach assembly line workers how to build uh, accordions. So CK essentially learned how to build the instrument that he had always played uh, from scratch. So uh, he was, he's became essentially an engineer and then became the, the manager of sales for a very large uh, an accordion uh, manufacturer in China. And, and of course, any instrument in China, because China's so big, has, is, is going to be selling quite a bit, and these, these are one of the top sellers now, so he's doing that right now. His dream towards the end of uh, me sort of chronicling his life uh, after he fails at his sandwich shop business turns into a religious dream. Like many young Chinese, he is, sort of he's a, his spiritual side himself is awakening and he finds a master in a small town uh, a Buddhist master and he follows this monk and, and becomes quite religious by the end of the book um, and, and I write a little bit about that as well because I believe right now is, is an interesting time in China where uh, you know the dreams of China in the 1990s when I first lived there were just there, everyone had the same dream make money make money. Now, a lot of those dreams, that, that dream has been accomplished by many, including CK, and those dreams have spread out to other dreams, to dreams of spirituality, of making myself better, improving myself, uh, dreams of justice, dreams of freedom, dreams of uh, being educated abroad. And so these dreams are spreading out like wildfire. Um, and that, I think, is in, in, it, it, it's an interesting conundrum for the government of China in some ways because the government of China has one of its main propaganda drives is called the Zhongguo Meng, or the Chinese dream, which uh, was uh, an idea that was birthed by Xi Jinping, by the current leader of, of China, and which is a dream basically that is a dream for the rejuvenation of, of China and the Chinese people. Um, but it also sort of essentially means that if you have your own dreams, you know, the dream of the country should take precedence over your dreams. And, and that's the message. 
But I think that that's a tough sell to a country uh, where everyone is materially well off or people are becoming more materially well off where they can dream other things. And so I write a little bit about that as well. The second uh, character in my book uh, is Zhao Shiling. And Zhao Shiling is from Shandong province. Uh, so she is also, so, so the first gentleman that I, that I just introduced you to, CK, he's from Hunan, so he's not from Shanghai. Zhao Shiling is also not from Shanghai. She's from Shandong province. She grew up in a coal mining town. She grew up um, very poor and ended up marrying a coal miner. Uh, and after having two sons, and sort of being the victim of a lot of domestic abuse, she decided to leave her home in 1992 after Deng Xiaoping told everyone to come and work in the factories and make money, and suddenly it was okay to make money in China. So she, she moved to Shanghai and started uh, working at a television assembly plant where she assembled televisions. She saved up enough money to, uh, to rent a space on Changlulu to sell flowers. And she found a, a, someone who could teach her how to do this, and she started her own shop. And uh, she now makes far, far more than her husband makes. And uh, so she now, uh, it's an, so I, I write about the power uh, switch between her and her husband. Because, uh, you know, before her husband would beat her uh, quite often, and when she would come home, uh, he didn't like that she worked in another place. And her people in her village would make, uh, you know, kind of a lot of gossip about her, about working in the big city. And they would say, oh, you're a prostitute. You know, you work in a massage parlor. So then she started wearing her factory uniform whenever she went home and wore it every day <laughs> to show people that she was working at a factory and, and, and working and making more money than anyone in her hometown. And, uh, and now she makes far more. And she, has, she owns uh, three homes. Uh, to one each for her own for her own son and then one for herself and uh, now her husband was forced to he was laid off at the coal mine and now he's come knocking at her door in Shanghai and she won't allow him to live with her <laughs> instead he lives in a dormitory and works at a hot pot restaurant and he lives in a dormitory at that hot pot restaurant so um, so the story about Zhao and her dream her dream was to provide for her sons. she has two sons and one of the big, you know, I know that you guys were given like indoctrination of the hukou system yesterday. So this story, I'm going to spare you the details of this, but, but this, her story is about hukou, really. Uh, because her son was one of the best students in his class in Shanghai when, he brought, when she brought him to Shanghai with her, uh, you know, when she started the flower shop. Um, he had won, uh, he, by the time he got to middle school, he had won a national essay writing competition. He was a, he was a star athlete in his school. Um, he basically was on this track to go to any university he would want to go to. However, because he did not have the hukou for Shanghai, his mother didn't have the hukou, he had to, at the time where he had to go to, 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 uh, to high school, he had to go back to Shandong to his coal mining town. And he quickly realized that uh, the, to study for the Gaokao, to study for the National uh, College Entrance Examination in Shandong is far, far more difficult in Shandong than it was in Shanghai. And he quickly dropped out of school and ended up uh, a migrant worker uh, just like his mother. And so I write a little bit about that. Uh, but his life turns around towards the end too. It actually is a pretty good ending. He's now a, he now trades stocks. And he's pretty good at it. He's, a, he's always a smart kid, and he's, he's, he's very good at it right now. Uh, the third character in my book is actually not a person. It is a place. It is a, an, ab an abandoned lot behind my, uh, my condominium complex. So we, when I moved in, my, my wife Lenora and I, we moved in uh, with our one son at that time, and now we have two sons. Our, this was the view from, uh, this is taken from our bedroom window. <laughs> And we live in the richest neighborhood, in the richest city of China. And so I thought it odd that this was our view, this abandoned lot with, with burned out homes. And so I, I was trying to figure out what the heck happened here. You know? And so my journalist mind is sort of working. Uh, and, so I, 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 and I also noticed that people were living inside these partially burned out homes. Uh, and so I, started, I, I got to know them. I started talking to folks inside. And I, I uh, learned about a very interesting story of a land grab in Shanghai 
which ended up being a pretty violent story. Um, what, what happened was uh, prior to me moving in, the government or the, the local government here, the district government in this, in this district, wanted to clear the land. They worked with the developer and the developer was a little overzealous. And in order to get people to leave, because many people wouldn't leave, the developer at one point started setting fires to people's homes while they were in them to try and get them to get out. That, if that, that's, that's a pretty, I have five minutes left. That's a pretty quick uh, way to get people to leave and uh, it didn't work so well. It ended up killing two people. And so uh, at that point, they didn't know what to do, so they just built a wall around the partial, partially demolished neighborhood. And I got to know the people that lived inside. And uh, there's a couple of the people. I'm going to spare you the details of this. But on the wall now are filled with, and this, it's, still, it's still abandoned to this day, but now they've pasted it with Chinese dream propaganda posters, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, the fourth characters in my book are two elderly people who are quite poor, and uh, I, I don't have pictures of them because uh, I've, I've kept their identity uh, secret because they, they're involved in some illegal Ponza schemes uh, because they're, they're both elderly folks that have been taken in by these pyramid schemes that are sort of rampant in China, and it's caused a lot of tension between the couple themselves. They, they absolutely hate each other, this married couple. And the only items of value, the reason I have this picture up, this, this is their living room. This is the only room that they live in. The only items of value in their room are two televisions because they cannot agree on what to watch. And so they will watch these two televisions at, at high volume. So when they're not arguing, their televisions are arguing on different, different programs. So whenever I would go over there to talk to them and interview them, I, it would, I, I'd come out of there in a, in a, in a daze. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to go into that. My last story was um, I stumbled upon, uh, actually I didn't stumble upon, uh, friends of mine who are antique collectors found a box full of letters at an antique shop in Shanghai. And all of these letters were written in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. And they were all addressed to one single address on the street that I was writing about. And so they, they lent me the letters, and uh, I tell the story about the folks that are involved in these letters. Is th they're letters between a man who was arrested for being a capitalist and then sent to a labor prison in Qinghai province uh, for 20 years, and the wife that he leaves behind and their six children. Uh, and uh, she has to give one of the chi children away to a family in the countryside during the famine. Um, but it was an incredible story. And, uh, and so I, 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 I tell this story, and I found the youngest son uh, through a lot of sleuth work. I found the, the youngest son, and he, he is now in New York City trying to make his way in Flushing uh, and basically living at the Flushing Library at the age of 56, uh, he's studying to get his diploma in high school and uh, doing what he can to get a college degree uh, at the, the end, uh, towards, you know, towards the, the middle part of his life. So it's about him, and it's about him, his life in New York City. Uh, do we have time for a story? We do? We have one minute. This story is about five minutes. Should I, should I, should I skip this? I don't know. I, I, I've got, I'm told I can't, play. okay, well, can we play it? Okay. This, this is, okay, sounds good. So this is one of the stories from the original radio series. The reason I wanted to play this story is because I know I'm telling a lot of individual stories. This is also an individual story, but I think it, it, it explains the relationship between the U.S. and China pretty well. I, I did my best, and I, it, it's what I think the relationship should be. And so I wanted to, to play this story for you guys. This is Marketplace from APM. I'm Kai Rizdal. I'm not a betting man by nature, but I do feel pretty safe in saying that during the presidential debate on Monday night, foreign affairs being the topic, remember, we're going to spend a lot of time hearing about China, how it's a currency manipulator and a trade rule breaker, and how cracking down on Beijing will help create American jobs. It's a given that China is a force to be reckoned with in the global economy now. 
but we and our presidential candidates wouldn't even be having these conversations were it not for one particular street in Shanghai and what happened on it in 1972. Our China correspondent Rob Schmitz is back now with another installment of his series, The Street of Eternal Happiness. Forty years ago, President Richard Nixon stood beside a helicopter on the south lawn of the White House. He was going on a trip. We must recognize that the government of the People's Republic of China and the government of the United States have had great differences. Nixon was headed to the Street of Eternal Happiness. That's where he and Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai would sign the Shanghai Communique, the first step in opening up trade between the United States and China. They signed it here, Street of Eternal Happiness number 175, the Jinjiang Hotel, an old brick building that looks the same today as it did decades ago. Chiu Huanxi was 24 years old back then. He worked the hotel service counter, a job that paid him $4 a month. Back in the early 70s, the rooms at the hotel were really cheap, 20 cents a night. It was the middle of the Cultural Revolution. Most of our guests came from other communist countries like Albania, the Soviet Union, and North Korea. The Xinjiang was the only hotel in Shanghai that could handle a big presidential visit like that one. Cho says he was lucky to have a job. The campaigns of Mao Zedong's Cultural Revolution had put China's economy at a standstill. At the time, Mao had a slogan called Dig Deep Holes and Hoard Grain. We had to dig bunkers where we would stockpile food to prepare for war and starvation. The bunker underneath the Jinjiang Hotel was a special one reserved for Mao himself. Suffice it to say, in 1972, life in China was different from life in America. The number one song in the U.S. when Nixon left for China was this sappy little number. No, I can't forget tomorrow when I think of all my sorrow. Now compare that to this chart topper in communist China the same year. In the weeks leading up to Nixon's visit, China's government broadcast this song over and over. It went like this. The east wind is blowing. The war drums are sounding. It's not the people who fear American imperialism, but American imperialism that fears the people. Catchy and daunting for the first presidential visit to China ever. The pressure was on, and it showed. Nixon started the trip at the Great Wall, where he took a look around, turned to his Chinese counterparts, and shared this shocking observation. I think that you would have to conclude that this is a Great Wall. Nixon's trip could only get better. It did, once he arrived to the Street of Eternal Happiness. In footage released by the Nixon Library, Zhou Enlai toasts Nixon and his wife at a banquet in the Jinjiang Hotel. Zhou Huanxi and the other wait staff were awestricken by what they were witnessing. They stood nervously at the back of the room, unsure of how to act toward the American guests. Our superiors told us not to be overly friendly to them, nor overly cold. We had to keep our distance. At one point, an American journalist turned to the hotel barber and said, In the U.S., we can protest a visit by a foreign president. We're very democratic. What do you think of Nixon's visit? The barber answered, The leaders are negotiating, but the people of our two countries are friendly. What a fantastic answer. His name was Wan Guoqi. I'll always remember him. Later on, as Cho and his colleagues corralled the journalists into the press conference room, Cho says his boss gave instructions to serve tea to the African-American journalists first. An effort, says Cho, to show solidarity with another group suffering discrimination under the American imperialist. Cho says there are a lot of things he'll never forget from that week. Nixon's room service order, sand plate chicken, fried shrimp balls, and fresh mushroom with broad beans. Pat Nixon's coat, bright red, says Cho. Above all, Cho never forgot Nixon's words that night, delivered after the signing of the Shanghai Communique. If we can find the common ground on which we can both stand, where we can build the bridge between us and build the new world, Generations in the years ahead will look back and thank us for this meeting that we have held in this past week. Cho says he feels honored to have played a bit part in history. Chinese people remember only a few U.S. presidents, but Nixon is our favorite. He threw off the airs of being an American. He came here to our China, and he and Chairman Mao changed the world. 
Cho says it's amazing. He grew up as a young member of Mao's Red Guard, targeting America as the enemy. Then he helped host Nixon at the Jinjiang Hotel, ushering in a new era of relations with the U.S. China and the U.S. are on the right track now. We can go to the U.S. and study and do business. I've taught my daughter we all need to contribute to Sino-U.S. relations. She's listened to her dad. She's grown up now, speaks English, and she works for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai, doing her part to bridge the trade relationship between the two countries. And now, 40 years later, the chorus of that sappy breakup song sums up the economic relationship between the U.S. and China well. The country's leaders may have spats here and there, but our economies are intertwined and codependent. From the okay. of eternal happiness. That's, 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 that's enough. That's this enough. This marketplace from APM. Let's turn I'm that off. <laughs> I'm not a betting man by nature. But All right. I, do I think we can do Q and A. Sorry that it went a little bit on Monday night. No Foreign affairs problem. being the so topic. Thanks. Remember. We're going to spend a lot of time hearing about China, how it's a currency manipulator and a trade rule breaker, and how.